If you would, please recite, recite the Second Chronicles 7.14. And my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves, pray to see my face, and turn from their evil ways, and I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Thank you. Now the pledge to the Bible. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp to my feet, and a light to my eyes. And I will hide its words in my heart, that I might not sin against God. Amen. Thank you. I pledge to the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So today we're going to look at a, a shot, snapshot of eternity. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. I did not get the references put in the bullet, so I will go slow when I announce those references, so you have a spot on the back that you can put them in. Uh, this week has been a little crazy with some things, pastor in the church and all. Just to review, the chain of discipleship so far goes this way. Jesus taught on humility. You must be humble to serve God. Because you've got to know that you have a master. Amen. And that you're willing to bend the knee to that master. Amen. So humility is important. The second link in the chain was the hollow Christians. This is the one where you need to protect yourself from giving just lip service. You know, we can speak Christianese, as they say, and not follow it in life. But that's not a true disciple. The third link was the cost of discipleship. You remember that one? That was the one where we had to really take in the cost of it, what it's going to take to serve Jesus Christ. Now, your decision is not whether to serve or not. Your decision is to go ahead and do it anyway, but just know it's coming. The next link was to be yourself. Do not fold or, fold or mold yourself into what society believes a Christian should be. Be real. Be who you are and serve Christ the best way possible. The next one was the Holy Spirit equips us to do just that. Remember, that's the, it's in their sermon. We don't have to do it on our own. Matter of fact, we should rely on the Holy Spirit's power and gifts and talents. The next uh, link in the chain was the reaction reaction. This is the one where we can't stop things that happen to us, but we do have a responsibility to react in a way that Christ would. Not what our human side wants to do. The next link in the uh, chain was stewardship. There is a different worldview to stewardship as there is a Christian view to stewardship. 
And we need to make sure that we are being good stewards of what God has given us. The next one was the value in life. This was the one that you made sure that your life reflects the values that God sets forth in Scripture. Because when we serve self, we choose to, to mark the level of what our values are. And they're skewed a little bit because all the values slant towards us because we want what we want. Christ's values that he teaches in the scripture is about loving one another, loving your neighbor as yourself. It's about giving and caring and serving. And this week, this week is a look at the end game. This is a snapshot of eternity and what it holds for us. And then next week's link is a warning for all those who serve Jesus. So hang in there with me. We're almost through this series. Let me give you three points on eternity. The first point is don't wait to be faithful. Procrastination points you in the direction of the way your life will, will run. Procrastination is the downfall to service of Jesus Christ. Look at verses 19 through 21 in Luke chapter 16. We're talking about the rich man and Lazarus. There was a rich man who would dress in purple and fine linen, feasting lavishly every day. But a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, was left at his gate. He longed to be filled with what fell from the rich man's table, but instead the dogs would come and lick his sores. We need to make sure that we understand this. Life is about situations and what you do with those situations. I don't know about you, but me, there has been plenty of times the Holy Spirit has said, you know what, we need to do this. And it's a great idea, and right, we do need to do that. I'll get to it tomorrow. And then we never return to it. Procrastination directs our life. It is a good habit to get into. It's when that great idea, the Holy Spirit that gives you, and you know what I'm talking about, it fills you with that that uh, overwhelming feeling of excitement about an idea that you know that God is directing for you. We need to take actions at that moment in time. We need to put that process in gear. My question is, especially in this situation where the rich man who had plenty, plenty that dropped from his table onto the floor, is why isn't it automatic for disciples to serve God? Why is there any question when it comes to sacrifice? You know, it would be a great idea. I should give whatever to the mission table. I'll do that next week. Why is it there's always a delay or a argument for delay in our minds? Well, the answer is Procrastination stops God's work. It stops us from serving God in the way that we need to. But you would think if we were a disciple of Jesus Christ and we are called to serve Him and our eternity is secure and we know we have a master and we know we're supposed to be good stewards and we know we should have humility and we know that we should follow, you would think it would be automatic. But why isn't it? The answer is, I believe, is that there's always tomorrow. That's what always gets into our mind. The problem is, is that we don't think about eternity as humans. We don't. Do you think about the end times? Does it come into your mind about the, your eternity and where you're going to spend it and the crowds that you should be collecting when you make the choices that you make? We don't think about it as humans until we're about to walk into it. And that's a shame because at that point in time, 
When eternity is looming at your doorstep, it's a little late to be collecting the crowns that God is expecting us to do according to Scripture. That's why we should always put the kingdom of God first in our mind. That's what Matthew says. <laughs> Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That should be in our mind every time that we make a true decision about what our family is going to do or the money that we're going to spend or the actions that we're going to take. It should be weighed with the accountability of putting the kingdom of God first. But we don't do that. A lot of Christians don't do that. You know what they do? They, they do what they want to do. What feels right to them at this moment in time. There is no word. Or there is no thought process about eternity at that moment. There's no thought process of this is a great opportunity to collect one of the crowns that God expects us to do. This is a great opportunity to press toward the mark. Or run the good fight of faith. Or fight the good fight of faith. No. What comes to our mind is what we truly want to do and when we want to do it. Eternity is not part of that equation. Serving God at that moment in time never becomes part of that equation. And that's the problem. There is a warning in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 13 and 14. Y'all want to hear it? Well, that's awesome, because that's what we read today. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 13 and 14, in case you want to write those down. I'll say it one more time. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 13 and 14. It says... And your herds and flocks will go large, and your silver and gold multiply, and everything else you have increases. Look at 14. Be careful. Circle careful. Underline it. Make note of it because it is a warning. Be careful that your heart doesn't become proud and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. We can modernize that verse by saying, Be careful. That you don't forget your master, the Lord your God, who brought you out of an eternity in hell. Who saved your soul from the lake of fire. Be careful that you don't forget him when you make the decisions with the blessings that he's given you. Be careful to weigh your choices with God and His kingdom always on your mind. Don't swell your ego with the decisions that you made that has made you successful or increased your material things. Don't swell it so much that there's not room and you forget the Master who is in control of everything, who has given you everything, who has blessed you with everything. You don't call the shots if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ. God calls the shots. And we should be looking to our master to give us the decisions, the choices that we need to make. The right ones. When you don't think about eternity, you don't prepare for it. Isn't that right? You know, people that die and they go to funerals, they usually doing funeral costs at that moment in time. Even though there are plans that you can pay off ahead of time. You can make all your arrangements ahead of time. You can prepare for it if it's on your mind, but we usually wait and let the loved ones take care of that. When you don't think about eternity, you don't prepare for it. You don't make decisions concerning it. Same as the church, by the way. When you're a member of a church and you're not thinking of the church during the week about the things that need to be done or about things that could improve the church or ministries about the church, if that's not on your mind daily, then you don't think you're not preparing to serve at the church. One thing I really dislike is when Church members show up Sunday and we've had all week to take care of an issue. We knew the issues there, but we wait till Sunday morning to run around and take care of the issue. But we don't think about the church, so we don't prepare to serve at the church. Say amen. Amen. Because that's the truth. Right? That's the truth. Things don't get done because we really just put it out of our mind. 
Matthew chapter 25, verses 11 and 12. This is, a, this is just a piece of a parable about the ten virgins. Now, if you don't know the story of the ten virgins, a quick snapshot. The ten virgins, is, they had a custom in marriage in the olden days. When they got married, when a brand new got married, and he was taking her to his, their house. See, that was one thing before the father would give permission to the bride, or for the groom to take the bride. He had to prepare a home for her. And not only did he have to prepare a home for her, the father of the bride had to go in and inspect it and say it was okay. So there was always a place for it. Well, tradition is that they lined the way with their friends that were virgins. And these virgins would have lamps to light the path and they would come through about like you do, you know, as a as the reception. They would come through and go into the house and then the ten virgins would follow in and they would celebrate the wedding. So in this parable, the ten virgins get there to, to light the path. They've got them all lit. But five of the virgins didn't have enough oil. They never filled their lamps before they came. They didn't think about it. So if they didn't think about it, they didn't do what? Prepare for it. I was scared you guys weren't listening. So they didn't prepare for it. So the five virgins go, hey, we're going to run oil. We're going to run back and get oil and then come back. So they run and go get their oil. But in the meantime, the groom and the bride came. So the five virgins with the lit lamps sort of spread out and lit the path. And they went in and they went in to celebrate. Well, the other five virgins finally came back with the oil, and this is what happened in verses 11 and 12. Uh, whoop, I guess I should turn to it. Oh, never mind, I read it down. Later, the rest of the virgins also came and said, Master, Master, open up for us. Verse 12. But he replied, I assure you, I do not know you. He didn't open up. To me, the message is stating this. And you can take it the way that you wish, but this is, this is me. If the groom is not important enough, or your master is not important enough, to plan ahead to serve him, then he truly isn't your master at all. Right? That makes sense. So what he's telling these five virgins when he won't open the door is that I don't know you because you did not ever serve me. You never embraced sacrifice. You never planned ahead. You never put me first in your mind for the decisions that you're about to make. You always did what you wanted to do and you never cared enough to prepare to serve me. And that's what's going to happen on Judgment Day. There are a lot of folks that believe they're going to heaven, but they're hollow Christians. They're shoeshine Christians. They're Christians by their lips and not by their actions. How do we know that? It's because they never prepare for eternity. God is clear in Scripture. We are to strive, to press toward the mark. We're to strive to get the crown so that we can lay them at Jesus' feet. I'm tired of Christians who say, well, it's His grace that saved us, so I really don't have to do anything to get into heaven. But is that truly a disciple of Jesus Christ? I've had Christians, I call them Christians. I have Christians that say, you know what, as long as I sleep on the curb in heaven, I'm good. I accepted him as my personal Savior. And I'm saying to them, not really. Because you're not following anything. You're not preparing for your eternity. You're not striving to gain the crowns. You're not putting God first in the actions. He's not first in your mind. You're not preparing to serve. And that is not a disciple of Jesus Christ. So they're going to be pounding on the door. And God's going to say, I don't know who you are. You never treated me like your king, your master, your father. You never prepared. You never followed what I have asked you to do.
You don't want to hear that. At least I am turned. That's our second point. Second point is called the flip. And we're going to look at it. Verses 22 through 26. One day the poor man died and was carried away by the angel of Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. I love the picture of this. It says when Lazarus died, he was carried away by the angel. When the rich man died, they just put him in the ground. He was headed that way in. Right? So we're just going to give him a little start. And being in torment, in Hades, he looked up and saw Abraham a long way off with Lazarus at his side. Father Abraham, he called out, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this flame. Interesting to note here that when judgment comes, we're not going to argue about the verdict. We're not going to show our case. The rich man is in agony. He's burning. He's in Hades. He's in hell. But yet there isn't an argument for Abraham to come save him. Is there? It's just having put a little water on my tongue to release some of this agony. Father Abraham, he called out, have mercy on me. Okay, we read that one. I think in the flame. Son Abraham said, remember that during your life you received your good things, just as Lazarus received his bad things. But now he is comforted here while you're in agony. Besides all this, a great chasm has been fixed between you and me so that, the, that those who want to pass over from here to to you cannot, neither can those from their cross, from there, cross over to us. In most cases, not all, but most cases, when we enjoy the first, when we enjoy first the things that life had, in other words, we manifest self, we suffer in the next life. Scripture says it is tougher for a rich man to enter into heaven as it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And it's just the point. Because of everything that they have is everything that they want to do. They can do anything they want to do with what they have. And they choose to fill their life with pleasure for themselves or whatever they want to do. They build $20 million mansions on top of you. I don't know if you ever noticed or not, but in the world of sports, it's never enough. A quarterback makes a deal for $15 million a year. Well, the next quarterback wants more. It's never enough. They just want what they want. In most cases, when we enjoy this life, we suffer in the next. There's, you know why? There's no preparation. There's no thought process of eternal. Or that you have a king, a master. Or that you have commands that you need to do. When we suffer with Christ in this life, that's called discipleship. When we suffer with Christ in this life, we enjoy the next life. Amen. Why? Because there are preparations. We chose in this life to stand with Christ and stretch ourselves, press toward the mark, embrace suffering and sacrifice, pick up the crowns, do God's work, be, hum uh, be humble in who we serve, and that reward is cashed in in eternity. And that's what this Lazarus and rich man story is all about. It's about your conscious choice to either be prepared for eternity by following and being a disciple of Jesus Christ or go ahead and enjoy your life and call the shots in this life and suffer through the next. Let me give you a case, an example in case here. That example is the government sent out stimulus checks. Lord, I 
when I got our stimulus check, you know, the first thing we did, we wrote a check for $240 and stuck it in the box that day. It's been sitting there since Wednesday. It's when we got ours. Because that needed to be the first thing that we did. Because God needed to be first. It was a blessing that we weren't expecting. And it needed to be honored by God. How many people you think that goes to churches throughout this country are writing tithing off their stimulus checks? Don't know, but I guarantee you the averages are not going to be high. That is about preparation for heaven or no preparation for heaven. I'm not saying that to pound. I'm just saying that's a great example of a blessing. So when we look at the two situations in the flip, when we look at we either prepare or we don't prepare for eternity, and the consequences for preparing or not preparing for eternity, which one looks best to you? Not preparation or preparation? Preparation. Preparation. Awesome. Because that's smart. But now, let's carry it over into real life. Let's set our minds for the examples of speaking and finding out what God wants first when we have choices to make. Let's press toward the mark. Let's fight the good fight of faith. Let's retrieve the crowns that God is talking about in his scripture. Let's do what is necessary to embrace sacrifice, to serve God, because that is preparation for the eternity that you're going to spend. Comparison time. Matthew chapter 13, verses 41 and 42. For suffering, the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather from his kingdom everything that causes sin and those guilty of lawlessness. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's the non-preparation side. Eternal life, 2 Corinthians 5.1. That was Matthew 13, 41 and 42 if you wanted it. Sorry. 2 Corinthians 5.1. For we know that if our temporary earthly dwelling is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal dwelling in the heavens, not made with hands. When this temporary life is over, the strength from faith tells us that we have a better place to go. We may suffer here. We will embrace sacrifice here. We will stand for Christ here, even if it's not popular. And we will suffer the slings and arrows of society or whatever the cause may be. But even in the end times, when you step through that doorway of eternity, your crowns await for you to set them at Jesus' feet. Third point. We having fun? Yeah. All right, I'm just checking. Just checking. <laughs> Blinding is our third point. Verses 27 through 31. Father, he said, then I beg you to send him to my father's house, because I have five brothers to warn them so that they won't come also to this place of torment. But Abraham said, we have, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if, you, if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. But he told them, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, then they will not be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. There are a lot of so-called Christians that are blinded by denial. And there are non-Christians that are blinded by sin and self. This blindness is taking them to hell. Don't be blinded by the lack of faith and strength of self-desires. Don't be persuaded 
by your desire and the lust for life. Faith allows you to suffer with Christ and deny self and serve. That's the key. Faith. Faith allows you to do what's necessary to serve God and deny self. Proverbs 28, 14 says, Happy is the one who is always reverent, but one who hardens his heart falls into trouble. The lack of faith or reverence leads to the word being despised. Psalms 50, 17 says, You, you hate instructions and turn your back on my words. The problem today and we're going to see this in Matthew. If you read Matthew, you're going to see what Jesus is talking about in times. He's going to talk about Christians who get fooled by miracles, by wondrous acts. Miracles. The problem with Christians today of needing a sign, needing of signs to prop up their faith means that they're very weak. They have to see proof before that they're willing to do something. And Satan, who is very powerful, can show you wonders and signs. Matter of fact, in Matthew, Jesus warns that it's going to happen. Miraculous wonders and signs. And people are going to flock to that. They're not going to look to God's word to measure those signs and wonders up. They're going to see with their eyes and they're going to believe it. I love magic. I don't know if you guys love magic, but I love that street magic when they do these tricks and things that happen. Don't know how they do it, but there's always a catch, you know, a gizmo or some sort of thing to it. But there are people on the streets that gather to see these things. And I always put it in my mind that it's going to be something like that. Luke eleven sixteen says, and others... As a test, we're demanding of him, Jesus, we're talking about, a sign from heaven. If you're truly God's son, then give us a sign. Prove it. That's not how discipleship works. Y'all know that, right? Discipleship works on faith, strength of faith. If you need a validation, a tangible evidence, to walk in faith or to follow Christ, you're in trouble. Validation to walk in faith is an oxymoron. How do you like that one? Good, right? It took me six days to figure that word out. You can't have validation of something, proof in hand, and have faith at it at the same time. You would think with the technology that we have today, they would be able to find Noah's Ark resting upon that mountain. They tried, but God hasn't allowed them to see it yet. Why? Because you wouldn't need faith at that point. Always trying to prove God or disprove God. Why not just have faith that it happened and it's up there? That's what faith is. Hebrews 11 one says, faith is the substance of things hopeful and the evidence of things that's not seen. That's faith. Faith belongs to the category of knowing in your heart but not needing that validation of seeing the proof. Because in end times, that validation of seeing that proof, that's a bad sign. Let me ask you a question. Do you need validation to serve your God in faith? And let me explain what I mean before you all shake your head no. I mean, do you wrestle in your mind with doing what God wants you to do? And do you have to force yourself to do it? Because you really haven't seen anything that proves that this is what God wants you to do. You see, it's a tricky question. I've had... Brothers and sisters, Christ said, well, I'm, I'm not quite sure if I'm hearing God in prayer is what he wants me to do. I, I don't know if it's God's voice or not. 
And the answer is always this. It's because that we, we want to put logic in. We want to interject our thought process into the prayer. You know, sometimes, sometimes God doesn't make sense. He uses the foolish to confound the wise, right? You have absolutely no idea why God wants you to do this in that moment in time. It makes absolutely no human sense. But that really shouldn't matter, should it? If we're truly living by faith, walk by faith, not by sight. If we're truly living by faith, we should just go ahead and do it. Right? I mean, it may look, make us look crazy, or it may absolutely have no idea why we're doing it. But is there a process in our mind that goes, well, that don't even make sense. So I'm not even sure God's talking to me. It's really a great excuse if you don't want to do it. But you're not living by faith. Faith is not a tricky thing, but faith is something that you need to embrace. You don't need a whole bunch of faith, and we're going to look at that next week. You don't need a whole bunch of faith to serve God. Faith of a mustard seed, right? But you do need to be obedient to it. You know it's of God. It may not make sense to you. But God expects you to do it. Lorna will do that all the time in stores. She's like a wild card. I'm glad she's not here at the moment. But God will tell her to do something, and I'd look around. She's gone. She's off talking to someone about Jesus Christ. Or giving them five bucks. Or doing this for them. Or doing that for them. Where are you going? Well, God told me to do that, so I wanted to do it. Okay. But we shouldn't be like that. It's about faith. So if you look back, I'm getting done here. If you look back to your walk in the past couple of months, is God first? Is the choices that you're making by faith for God? I'm not pointing fingers. I'm just using it as an example. When you looked at your bank account and that money hit, the first thing that comes to your mind is, I've got a tithe on that. Or what are we going to do with that? Serving God should be first to every decision that you make. And that's gifts, talents, times, abilities, finances, everything that you are. You are a good steward of what God has given you. Amen? The point I'm trying to make here, I'm not trying to yank money out of your wallet, but the point I'm trying to make here is that serving God now prepares you for eternity then. Your choices that you make today in serving God by faith count when eternity comes with the crowns that you're going to lay at Jesus' feet. If you choose to live a life that is self and not serve God, then you will have no crimes and you may not have the eternity that you're thinking that you're going to get. If you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, you should understand this point. God should be first in all of your thought processes, all of your decision making. He should be first. You should be giving him praise his first thing when you wake up. He should be the first thing on your mind and the last thing at night when you go to bed. Or if you work third trip, vice versa. Quiet time, meditation, prayer, study of God's word, all these things. Open heart with prayer to see where God wants you to serve and do the things that you want to do. All these things lead to eternity and your judgment. Make sure you're Lazarus and not the rich man. Bow your heads with me if you will. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you can change that. If you're watching by video, you can do the same. All you need to do is say this prayer. You don't have to say it out loud, but you do have to mean it. Lord, forgive me of my sin. I'm lost and I need you in my life. Replace my will with yours and I will follow you for an eternity. 
It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. With every head still bowed and every eye still closed. If you said that prayer through our video ministry, welcome to the family of God. When you are comfortable, you can come to Shine and I Baptist Church. Tell us about that decision that you made. The address is on the screen. So that we can start you on your path of discipleship. If you have a home church or a church that you're comfortable in, when you're comfortable, uh, go to that pastor and tell him about the choice that you made as well. If you're here today and you said that prayer, just raise your hand and look up at me. I ask you three questions. Okay, that's good because I think we're all believers here. If you're here today and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you're reflecting upon your life, on your prayer life, on your study of your word, if God's first in the morning and your meditations and your quiet time is the last thing in your mind, do you seek God's will in prayer for decisions that you're making? All these things that lead to a true discipleship of Jesus Christ. Have you been doing that for the past month? Have you been studying God's Word? Have you been doing devotions? Have you had quiet time? Have you sought God in the decisions that you're making? Are you calling the shots? Or are you a disciple allowing God to call the shots? These are all things that you have to figure out because it really means a lot. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. And I know I'm running in just a hair late, but I feel good about it. If you're doing that and you want to be honest, nobody else is looking around, but I'd really like to pray for you by name because this is so important. If there are shortcomings in this life for these reasons, just slip up your hand so I can pray for you by name. Amen, 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 amen. Thank you, thank you for your honesty. I've got it and I will be praying for you this week. And the reason I did that is because it is hugely important. Hugely important that we get this part right. That we think of God first because your walk is affected. The ability to gather crowns is affected. Your judgment may be affected. We have to be all in serving this, the disciples. All right, you may raise your head, stand with us if you will. Uh, be, we just in our